Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and today I'm sharing how I find free-to-use archival footage for the weekly web series I produce. Well, hello, Mr. Hammond. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you, Nick? Fantastic. Fantastic. So for for people who missed last week's show, I revealed that I am now working for a company called Recount Media, and Mm -hmm, we make... mm -hmm political recap videos. You can download our app on the iOS store, Android coming soon. And there's a series that I produce called Rewind. You're familiar with this? I'm familiar with it, but I'm not sure our audience is. Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so, I mean, you can go to therecount.com slash rewind, and every week I make a historical look back, kind of a deep dive into the archives of some political story that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. And so today I wanted to kind of talk about some of the tricks I've learned because I think I think this week I'm working on my 19th episode. Oh my god. I'm way yeah. behind. I got to catch up. I apologize. <laughs> What's your That's best okay. one? What should we all go look at? So, the rewind.com. No, the recount. No. <laughs> the recount.com <laughs> slash rewind.com slash rewind. That's the problem with branding everything as a re <laughs> So if you were to say, all right, you're going to go look at one of these, what would it be? I think I'm, I think I'm pretty proud of the Cuban Missile Crisis episode. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Clicking it. Oh, I don't need to play it now, not while we're recording a podcast. The link will be in the show notes. I put it in our script this week. I did one about the impeachment of President Clinton, which is kind of interesting because it's like parallel timing mm-hmm. kind of to what's happening right now. So... I, I think back to like when I made the Sriracha documentary. Do you remember how much I had to spend for archival footage? Wasn't it like your biggest single cost for the whole thing was getting that archival footage you could use in the in the film? Yeah, this was. I think it was Reuters footage from 1979, and it cost like twenty five hundred dollars to get all the rights to it. Um, and there's different rights, right? Like you need rights for web streaming, and you need rights to distribute it on to disc, and you need rights for all these different things, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 they're able to do that because they own the footage, and there's it's not publicly available footage. I suppose if it was just out on YouTube, even if they say we're charging for it, I, it's possible you could make some fair use argument and say, right, I have a news right to show this. It tells my story, and it's available, and I've already got it. <laughs> right. So it's but a the, lot of these uh... stock websites work the way they do because they can offer you the high quality footage. So there is one service we do pay for. I mean, well, we have several services we pay for. Um, but today I kind of want to focus on the free stuff. But I will just say off the bat, I do get a lot of footage from AP Archive because we mm-hmm. use uh, we subscribe to AP Images, and they also have a great archival service. So I don't know how much that would cost per clip. But uh, but this I is something some. your company pays for, an ongoing yeah. subscription that gives you basically unfettered access and can use it however you like. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, or we get like a certain number of videos every month or something, but it's it's nice. Plenty. And those are pretty high quality downloads. Like I'm downloading high bit rate MXF files. One service that I use that that's that's free and, and pretty interesting is archive.org. Are you familiar with that? You know, I've heard of it, but I don't know that I've really ever been there. Archive. Are you familiar with the Wayback Machine? Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. For the the internet archive. Uh, they also do a ton of like news archiving so they have they have all sorts of news footage captured from the last 10 years and it's all searchable by captions Mm -hmm. so if i'm looking for footage from i mean i can't do the the cuban missile crisis because it's too long ago but like some of my some of my episodes like joe the plumber do you remember him (laughs) no Joe the Plumber was a uh, was a guy that uh, was on the campaign trail when McCain was running against Obama. No doubt, the most famous plumber in the country this morning. Joe, 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 Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber asked Barack Obama a tough question and became kind of this like conservative hero. No, I don't. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> but you, you know, I'm not as plugged in as you. Yeah, to well, you got to watch uh, the Joe the Plumber episode. But that was, uh, I, I mean, I guess that was actually that may have been just outside the archive.org range because it really is only like ten years back but i find i find a lot of stuff uh through that service i also find a lot of stuff on c-span and a lot of stuff on youtube c-span too. has an archive yeah c-span has like 
I mean, if you're, you're looking for political stuff, CCN has probably, you know, there's like inaugurations on there. There's ses- Senate sessions and House of Representatives and that sort of thing. And there's correct me if I'm wrong, C-SPAN style. is the channel where you can go watch, like, the House of Representatives live, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And they have, they have a that, ton of videos online. Is that a nonprofit and or a government entity, or is that a for-profit entity? I think C-SPAN is, is created, I think it was mandated by the government that they create it, but it's it's the cable companies, I think, built it. Okay. You know, that, like, there's that, there's that kind of, uh, like... All the networks have to have nightly news because it's like mandated by the law, by like by the FCC to, laws. Yeah, like it's part yeah. of their how they got their license to broadcast, right? Right. Like public service is an important part of what they do, and I think C-SPAN kind of falls into that. It was created to do what it does. Interesting. Yeah. So it's all so. Free. It, well, it's not all free. You can you can buy clips, but I uh, I also download clips from all these places from like archive.org and c-span and and youtube just using a video downloader software okay and then i mean it's up to you depending on what you're doing if you're making a documentary you have to decide if you have fair use protection to use these clips but we feel that if we're telling a story about the news and we're talking about the news we can show these clips and and we're transforming them and we're Yes, directly referencing them. So I think we have a strong fair use argument. What, do you, what can I ask? What video downloading tool you use to do that? Yeah, I use a piece of software called UniConverter, hmm. which is made by a company called Wondershare. I'm not familiar with it. It it was. I, I noticed it's a little bit more expensive now than it used to be. Uh, like I think I paid sixty dollars for it. And I think I had a li- that's for a lifetime license, and now I notice it's eighty dollars, but. Here's what I'm kind of curious about, and maybe you know this or have some insight here, is there's a ton of video downloaders on on the internet. I mean, some of them, there are free ones. There's online ones. There's web browser-based ones that seem to work well for some things, like maybe you can download YouTube videos, but maybe nothing else. But I, it feels like a lot of the free downloads are just full of adware. Yeah, I'm pulling up my preferred tool right now and looking to see if it supports some of these sites. Um, have you heard of YouTube Downloader or YouTube-DL? I have heard of that, yeah. Um, that's my go-to. Uh, it's an open source project. It's pretty well done. And my guess is it supports all of it, most, if not all, of these sites. Yeah, uh, and that one is not... It's not browser based, is it? Is that a... it is command line based, which right. might be that that's a little hurdle, but because it's command line based, it's super uh, powerful uh, and gives yeah. you lots and lots and lots of options, and it's not that hard to use. Right. So I think that one was could recommended you send to me, me and a I was a bit... link to a short video clip, something you would download, and let me see if I can download it with the yeah. Video. Let, let's just go right to the C-SPAN site, and we'll just pick like the first thing there. Oh, there's a there's a Senate session from today. I'm going to try it right now. This is very exciting podcasting, hearing us type. Yeah. Let me try it on my app. Let's see if this works. C SPAN, downloading web page, downloading JSON metadata, downloading XML, downloading M3U eight information, downloading the map. Yep, here we go. It's pulling it down. Cool. Senate Pro Forma session dot MP four. Nice. Um, so this is a pretty popular tool, and uh, definitely no adware because it is command line based. Right, um, you can see everything it's doing. So, so yeah, now we I... should definitely put the link to YouTube DL in the show notes for anyone that's interested. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll put my software as well. Um, but why, like, I why is that that like some software categories like video downloaders seem to be full of adware and others I think it's just stuff that people think oh god they're going to google for this and download it to use it one time you know which is what most people are doing and they just they're they're trying to extract maximum value from that download and they just take advantage of people yeah so (sighs) if people are downloading stuff like this and they suspect that something's up suddenly their web browser is pointing to a different search engine or something and they think that they've been Adwared. What what kind of things can people do to get rid of that stuff? Well, I would recommend malware bytes on Windows. Is uh, and Mac too. Do they have what it on Mac? Recommend? Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sure it would be good on Mac then. I've never needed a anti-malware tool on Mac, but I'm sure it happens. I don't know on Mac really. Yeah. Okay, so we got the tools. We've downloaded the video. We think we've got a fair use reason to use it. What else we got yeah. to do? Well, there are also places you can look for, like, explicitly free to use things. Uh, one one place that I often find myself looking is in presidential libraries. Like, every president has their own. You know, it's like a Bush presidential library, a Clinton presidential library. Kennedy, and and they have so they have web. This is a physical presence as well as a web presence. You're saying, yeah. So they also have like a digital library online, and some of them are better than others. Like I, I don't think the, I don't seem to remember the, the George W. Bush library being very rich in terms of what's available on the internet, uh, but like the Clinton library, and I remember the Kennedy library, especially when I was doing uh, Cuban Missile Crisis stuff. It was so searchable, and you could pull so many images. And these are images that are owned by, they were produced by the White House. Maybe now they're owned by the National Archives. I'm pretty sure you either have a very strong fair use argument to use them, or they may even be free for you to use because they are created by the government. You would think so, yeah. Yeah, we our tax dollars paid for these things to be created. Like I, all the time, I'm happy to use like Pete Souza's photos of Obama. Right in the White House because they were created with my tax dollars. I have um, that book. Oh, yeah. It's a nice book. So these are also great tools for finding, I mean, you can find documents and you can find photos and videos and things like that. Um, and then some of the, my stories that I've done, if I'm just like really having a tough time finding photos or videos, I've started pulling like newspaper headlines, especially if I'm doing mm-hmm. a story that involves like the 1800s or something. I maybe can't find a lot of rich media, but I can find newspaper headlines, and I use a service called newspapers.org, which is actually $60 a year, but you can also do a seven-day free trial, and I think you can still download all the stuff you want during those nice. seven days. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I really And you can be on. a historical documentary filmmaker. Right. Like Griffin Well, I just figure, like, any doc... If you're, if you're making any sort of documentary that's tangentially related to politics or news and you need to tell part of that story that maybe you can't shoot yourself, there are ways to access these sorts of things that you could find useful in a way that's legal and potentially free. And I've had some fun kind of exploring. Like, some of this must be like how they do it on The Daily Show, right? Yeah, exactly. You're looking for like an old Bill O'Reilly clip or something. You, you can find it. So let's run it down. We've got YouTube, we've got C-SPAN, we've got archive.org, we've got the AP, we have presidential libraries, pick your favorite president, and (laughs) newspapers.org has a free trial. Did I get it? Yeah. I've also, like, I've included some, like, Saturday Night Live clips and some, uh, like, I think Will Ferrell was in my last episode because we were talking about the Florida recount. And that's he does that great George W. Bush impression. Um, I've even included some like John Stewart from The Daily Show years ago because Comedy Central keeps really high quality files. Like like if you watch old episodes, they're available and they look great. They're not like 360p. They're like 480 and good compression level. We, we that do problem. have an email from Luke in the UK. I'm wondering if you want to read this. Sure. Luke in the UK says, I'm making my first big documentary focusing on politicians. I was wondering what uh, sort of backlash, if any, you've had from being a political filmmaker with Bloomberg. This is a subject I really want to cover, as it is such a big problem over here for our democracy. It's also a film I want to see made, but just wondering if you had any safety tips based on your experiences. Well, this reminds me of, like, in the last election cycle, I was on the campaign trail a lot. I went to a lot of Trump rallies, and I don't think I ever felt unsafe, although near the end of the campaign, he was starting to call out the press a lot, which didn't feel great. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah. So people are, like, looking at you and sometimes yelling at you. But generally, I was just nice to people, and I'd, I'd tell people where I was from. I think it probably helped that I was from Bloomberg, which I don't think people have strong opinions about. Right. 
Like, they think of it as middle of the road. Now, had you been from the failing New York Times, you <laughs> might have had a little bit more yep. trouble. But we did go to Cleveland for the Republican National Convention, and I remember they brought some, like, security contractors with us and kind of, like, like gave us some like basic Bloomberg training. Like Bloomberg gave you security? or Yeah. Interesting. Because we were concerned about there was talk of big protests happening outside the Republican National Convention mm -hmm. all, all over the streets of Cleveland. And the idea was that if we had to move through the city to get to the convention every day, that maybe we'd get caught up in something bad. Um, okay. So they, I think they even made like riot gear available to us. I can't even remember. Maybe we even had like bulletproof vests. <laughs> Jeez. I think ultimately we didn't need any of this. Like the riots did not get out of control. They weren't riots. They were just regular old protests with drums and everyone was happy. And so, yeah. <laughs> but that is a, it is an important consideration. Uh, but I do think in the news world, there are people that are willing to go into to these really dangerous situations into war zones. And I'm just not that guy. So I'm willing to turn down an opportunity if it sounds like it's going to get me into trouble. Interesting. Yeah. Do you but ever yeah. get any backlash from YouTube commenters or anything that concerns you in terms of just random people reaching out to you because of what they feel is a bias in your coverage? Well, I, I was reading through last month's, uh, our, our last episode, I was reading through the YouTube comments and most of them are very positive. I mean, not like we were talking about anything political. We were just saying that I went to Iowa to cover the, the presidential candidates. Right. And there was like one comment that was completely incoherent. I have no idea what he was talking about, but he seemed to be angry or almost made it sound like I was, of because course, you my were camera covering, fell because uh, I was covering Bernie Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't make any sense. But so there is that kind of thing. But I, I generally think that if, if you consider your biases and you are approaching this like I want to present what happened in front of my camera and not I'm not going to tell you what to think or how to vote I just want to show you what a candidate says and you can decide if you agree with that or not and Good. I think smart people get that <laughs> I get it Griffin and I'm not yeah. that smart <laughs> well can I tell you a little bit about Squarespace please do Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Squarespace has tons of beautiful templates ready to go, so you are starting with a professional-looking website. But if you're like me and you like to mess with, tweak the attributes, I picked a template that just kind of gave me the shape that I liked for a site, and I really did go in and, and mess with everything. But all the tools that you're putting in for content, they're all drag and drop. So when I build every month's page for the podcast, I pull in the YouTube video. And one thing I really like is you pull it in, you can, it could be the full width of your site. It could be, I have kind of a two column thing going on. It's easy to drag it around and it reshapes to however you want to do it. And then one thing I like is last week I put the film that I shot from Iowa but I didn't love the thumbnail that my company chose on YouTube, which is what automatically populated. But you can put in your own thumbnail for any video on Squarespace. So I just changed it to something I liked more. Well, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Griffin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you, Squarespace. Thank you, Squarespace. Griffin, did you hear the earth-shattering news? I'm bringing you breaking Apple news. Well, you told me, or you shared some link with me that said that, is there a new Mac Pro that's like $52,000? Well, if you max out everything, <laughs> yes. Okay? It can cost a little bit of money. So the Apple has released a new Mac Pro. Not talking about, last week we talked about the MacBook Pro. This is yeah. the Mac Pro. This is a a back to the tower form, a bit of the cheese grater look. So I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah, because was the last Mac Pro the trash can one? The trash can one, right. That came out in 2013. Okay, that's and how that's long been the, the trash shape can until came now. Well, they never updated it. They right. never updated it since then. And they'd been selling that up until like last week. <laughs> yeah. That was what, and it was from 2013. Like all the parts were from 2013. <laughs> um, 
So Apple got a little crazy with the trash can, and they, in their own words, they painted themselves into a thermal corner. Okay, so hmm. there was a lot of concern that Apple didn't really care about professional users anymore. They were moving away from it. A couple about two years ago, Apple brought in some reporters and said, "No, we're doubling down. We care about pros. We're going to build a new Mac Pro. You're going to love, but it's going to take a while. We're going to release a thing called the iMac Pro, which you use now today, I believe. Yeah, um, and that's been out for a couple of years. But this is the big guy. This is what everyone who does super high end work has been waiting for, and it has a super high end price to go with it. Um, but you actually find, you know, this is not for most people, and it's really not even for people like you who do no. pretty, and not, this is not derogatory, but fairly basic video editing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you this, you shared with me a, a video of these professionals using Logic Pro, the right. audio, like, live studio software. And so let's let's talk about that a bit. That this is a video by Jonathan Morrison, and the title is "This 2019 Mac Pro Review is Different." So I, I just saw this flying around Twitter. I didn't know Jonathan Morrison before, uh, right. and I watched this what turned out to be a 17-minute documentary about right. <laughs> really professional music uh, producers using this new tool and kind of seeing what they can do with it. And I just thought it was just a, a fantastically told story. Even if you don't care about the Mac Pro at all, I, we'll put the link in the show notes. I'd go check this out. It's really a well done, quote unquote, review, but it's really just like, what can we do if we give this tool to professionals and watch them create something? And I just right. found it to be a fascinating video. Well, and my first thought as I was watching it is like, what could music people be doing with a computer that's l gonna be more powerful than what I, as a video person, do? But I immediately see that it's because they're doing so many live effects. Like you have a hundred different tracks, different instruments, vocals, doing all these things. And then on top of each one, you're applying a compressor and a reverb effect, and you're letting these all run live. Whereas I imagine if I was doing this on my computer, I'd have to render everything before it could play. Any exactly. Of stuff and you know, they're trying to do live recording, right? So they want to be able to play back everything they just did while they record new tracks on top. So even yeah. they weren't pushing this thing all the way, but they were doing things they said they simply couldn't have done with the, you know, the iMac yeah. Pro or something like that. Well, I realized on my iMac Pro, we have some, some audio plugins that we've used in Premiere, like to do live, uh, normalizing the audio, leveling it. And mm -hmm. I find that if I add that too early in my workflow, like while I'm still editing, it slows down my uh, my audio meters. Like the computer's still playing okay, mm -hmm. but it's just not able to show me audio meters correctly. And so I realize even just like one live plugin that's trying to do a bunch of smart things is is too much. I think you could do it workflow. on this thing. So if you want to yeah. tell your work that you need a new <laughs> Mac Pro, they actually, so they started about six grand, which is okay. incredibly expensive, but for what you get uh, is pretty reasonable. But yeah. it has just so many options you can spec up that it does get kind of out of control. How many gigs of RAM does your work computer have? Do you know? I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know. It's I want to say 32? 64. Or maybe it's 64, yeah. I don't know. It has a lot, we, we said. So I don't know if you've looked. Do you know how much RAM you can get in this Mac Pro? Did I say it was like terabytes? 1.5 terabytes of RAM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, that option, so the base comes with 32 gigs. And if you would like to okay. go all the way up to the 1.5 terabytes, that will be an additional $25,000. Oh, jeez, wow. So that's a lot of RAM. Um, yeah. And you also need one of the two highest end processors to support it. So there's six or $7,000 on top of that. Yeah. You can get it with an uh, upgraded video card. You can get it with two upgraded video cards. Or you can get it with this one video card that actually has two video cards on one card. Or you can get two of the two video card video cards. <laughs> OK, you with me so far? <laughs> and you'll be able to spec it up up to eight terabytes of internal SSD. And then here's what's cool for video editors, the Apple Afterburner card. Have you heard of this? I have no idea what this is. So this is a FPGA. Do you know what FPGA stands for? No. Field Programmable Gate Array. Field Programmable Gate Array. <laughs> Hopefully I'm getting this right. And what that is is think of it like a chip. 
you know how sometimes like uh, you'll hear about something being like hardware accelerated, like maybe video playback yeah. for H.264 is hardware accelerated. And that just means like all the work that the processor would normally have to do can be offloaded to something that's just been designed specifically to do that. And it's a million times faster and more efficient. Yeah, I think in, well, in uh, Adobe Media Encoder, you have the option to like use the hardware uh, accelerated, you know, for like exporting. So this uh, Apple Afterburner card right now is designed to accelerate high-end ProRes workflows. So if you've got like high-end 422 ProRes 4K streams, this yeah. will offload all of that decoding to the Afterburner card. Oh, nice. Um, actually, up to 8K. So I think um, they've said that this system can handle playback of like 6 to 8 8K streams at once, which is insane. Yeah, but what's cool is because it's a field programmable gate array that what that isn't baked into the chip, the chip can be programmed in the field is what that means. So they can literally change. So that could in a year upgrade the firmware and it'll make some changes and now oh, wow. support a new Kodak or something like that. So oh, yeah. very cool for for high end users. Also, oh, yeah. you can get it with wheels. Which the tower. The tower. Yeah, that's a four hundred dollar <laughs> option. Those are very nice wheels. Who's rolling so, their computer around? Well, they said a lot of people who roll these things on, like, film sets and stuff like that. They want to be able right, to yeah. roll it up into a truck and then roll it around on set and that kind of thing. So yeah. I think there's lots of people who need the ability to move this around to wherever they're doing this high-end work. Right. So is this a computer for you and me? No. Is it a computer no. for anyone listening? Probably not. Is it incredibly expensive? Yes. Is it overpriced? No. Um, if you go... You know, spec out a Dell workstation with a similar specs, you'll come up with very similar pricing. Yeah. So it's well, fun. If it's too expensive, then no one will buy it and the market will That's correct. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, but I'm really enjoying watching the reviews. I Justine did a review of it, MKBHD did a review of it. Um, and, and you got to go watch this, this uh, different review from Jonathan Morrison. It was very cool. Yeah, we could put that in the show notes as well. If you have 17 minutes and want to watch, some really nice music being produced right in front of your eyes. It's a fun piece. I, I thought, I mean, it, it was basically a documentary, wouldn't you say? And would you call that a documentary? Yeah. I mean, I would have edited a little tighter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but you're a very tight editor. I yeah. really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed yeah. it. So I want everyone to go watch it. Tell me what you think. Yeah. Leave a comment about what you think. That's what oh, YouTubers yeah. do, and, right? We say leave a yeah. comment. I, I meant to say people should leave comments on. I'd love to know what kinds of tools you use to download clips or if you have other tricks for pulling archival kinds of things off the internet, your go to sources. Maybe I'll make a quick, you know, one of my short 17 second tutorial videos about how to install and use YouTube DL for archival C SPAN footage. You should so that I know how to do it. <laughs> It'll help me with I'm my gonna job. Do it. I'm going to do it. All right. Well, what else, my friend? This is our final episode of 2019 before we, we celebrate How the holidays. How many years have we done this? Have we, did we do it all of 2018 and all of 2019? Yeah. When we, did we start? Uh, when did we start? Does anyone anyone watching know? Is there a website? If I go to hey.film, it won't load, and you still tell me it's my fault, not your fault. So I'll go to griffinhammond.com slash podcast. Yeah, for some reason, Nick is unable to load the website of this Let podcast. me know. If you go to hey.film, does the website load? If it doesn't work for you, please leave a comment, because Griffin yeah, thinks I'm crazy. it's always loaded for me. It won't load for me. Hey.film, the, the podcast website, doesn't load. It's supposed to just redirect immediately to griffinhammond.com slash podcast, but it yes. uh, doesn't do it for me. Um, let's see. Yeah, our first episode was the the Older. end of 2016. So we did all of 2017, all of 2018, all of 2019. Oh, my God. We've been doing this a long time. Yeah. It's been well, three, we used to do it. Years. Did we used to do it weekly or biweekly? We did it once a week, yeah. God, that was a lot of work. Which I can't imagine doing now with our children. I always had children. You're the, you're the <laughs> new parent here. I do have more children. Hey, before we go, you, you told me that your office is pretty messy. What's going on? Oh, God, yeah. Sorry, I was going to point this out. So I apologize for all of this. It's Christmas time. We've got packages flowing in. I've got nowhere to put them. My office is a mess. Griffin knows before we started recording, like, I couldn't find the right cables to hook up my audio recorder. You couldn't recorder find an SD that, card. That I couldn't find start. an SD card. <laughs> 
It was. Uh, and usually I'm the one that rough. takes forever to set up. And this was, yeah, yeah this is the one day where you're like, I'm ready to go right on the dot when we said we were going to go. I'm like, ah, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm normally ready to go. I try to be. Oh, should we tease our next episode? Yeah. So, so you have this idea. You want to hang on, hang upgrade on. your. <clears throat> one of the boxes. Look at this. GDM, what are you, what are you great showing video up? maker. I'm showing a giant cardboard box that's sitting in my office that says GVM on it. Great video maker. Is that the brand? <laughs> that's the brand. What is this, a light? This is a light. So uh, I'm well aware that this setup looks pretty bad compared to what Griffin <laughs> does and what other people do. So I've got like one crappy LED lighting panel and then like room lights. So I bought a lighting kit on Black Friday. And we're oh, going to nice. do an episode. Griffin, get ready for this because it involves you. We're going to do an episode. <laughs> I'm going to live stream my camera shot to Griffin. And we're gonna yeah, not to the, the world. N- just to not me. Not to the world, just to Griffin. While we do our podcast recording, and I will go from this lighting setup to a new professional lighting setup. With right my in front of your kit. eyes. Right in front of your eyes. So I'll have Griffin talk me through placement of lights, colors, all the kind of things we want to think about when setting up a shot like this, and he'll be able yeah, to see. Yeah, because normally results. I can't. Like Lots. right now, I can't see you, but you're gonna you're gonna set this up so I get a nice view of your room as we go. Yes, sir. And then we'll have to talk about how you managed to do that because I'm. It's kind of blowing my mind that you're gonna be able to feed me multiple sources of video, two different cameras, and still record and do the FaceTime audio and everything. Yeah. Um, I think I have an idea of how I'm going to make it work, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see yeah. if it works. So that'll be that'll be next month's episode in January. It's going to be tremendous. It's gonna, we're going to start out 2020 with a bang of beautiful lighting. <laughs> All right. I've been drinking coffee. I, I don't know if you can tell. My energy <laughs> level has gone up through the episode, which is nice. Which well, we should leave it at that. Nice. We should leave it at that. Goodbye, everybody. Happy holidays. I use a package manager for Mac called Homebrew, which is handy. It's a command line thing. And now I'm going to do a brew install YouTube DL.